Amen. You may be seated. Um, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. And um, I'm talking about today a, a battlefield, a little song. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will. And then the songwriter goes on, but I've come here to stay. And, and, and with Battlefield Grit, uh, that song is uh, sung and, and written. And I wonder if we could take it as a title for these verses that we're going to read in our next of our text of First Peter in chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and verse 12. I wonder if as I read the text very slowly and take a little time to park on some of the words that you could uh, maybe feel the text. I wonder if you could feel it instead of just read it, that it would come out and grab you like when Peter says, and I echo uh, the phrase, dearly beloved. Do you, do you feel the love? Uh, do you feel the camaraderie as we shared together uh, uh, as brothers up here until Graceland came and, and with arms around each other? Uh, dearly beloved, dearly beloved. I, I wonder if you could feel Peter, who was the rough and tough fisherman, probably didn't hug too many people except some slimy fish and was told by Jesus to love one another, even the tax collector next to him who got most of the fishes before he got the rest home to eat. Uh, and, and he was told to love uh, one another. Can you feel that? Um, can you feel the urgency? I beseech you. I beg you. I beg you. Uh, imploring his readers, uh, beseeching, begging. Uh, can you feel the identity? If you don't feel it, we'll spend a couple more weeks on this uh, with Brother David speaking on our identity in Christ coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, but here, words of pilgrim and words of stranger. I beseech you as uh, strangers and pilgrims. Can you feel uh, the necessity uh, to abstain from fleshly lusts and the intensity of a, of a warfare that's going on, which war against your soul? Uh, can you feel the integrity needed that having our conversations honest among the Gentiles and, and feel and sense the hypocrisy that we live amongst, that whereas they speak uh, against you as evildoers, that we positively, uh, by good works which they shall behold, that we would head toward the finality, glorify God, in the day of visitation. So I wonder if I could ask you to not only hear the text, but feel the text. Continue that feeling in the sense of being prepared, prepared today for a spiritual battle. I felt uh, a spiritual battle in preparation for this very sermon, very sermon. Uh, today, more people are interested in sports, if you can believe it or not today, uh, than they are in God's Word. I remember the uh, uh, front page article on a Sunday a few seasons ago uh, of the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it was the picture of the top of the stadium, and it was the picture through the arms of someone held high in worship, and, and it was of the whole stadium and the football teams there assembled, uh, not to worship Jesus, but assembled uh, to beat up on each other. And, and, and the big title of the article was we worship here on Sunday. And I'm going to run right over here and not uh, not run over. <laughs> uh, but here's, here's what I got today. Uh, 12 reasons. 12 reasons why I, as a pastor, have decided to quit attending sporting events. Okay, now just, just listen to this. I got this amongst a group of pastors and it has a bit of sarcasm in it. 12 reasons why I, as a pastor, have decided to quit uh, attending sporting events. The coach never came to visit me, okay? Every time I went, they asked for money, okay? Uh, people sitting in my row weren't very friendly, all right? The seats were very hard. The referees uh, made a decision I didn't agree with. I was sitting with hypocrites 
and 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 they only came to see what others were wearing. Okay, some games went into overtime, and I was late getting home. The band played some songs I never heard before, and and the games are scheduled on my only day to sleep in, and and my day off to run errands. Okay, besides. My parents to, took me to too many games when I was growing up, forced it upon me. And since I read one book on sports, I feel that I know more than the coaches anyway. I don't want to make my children uh, come because I want them to choose for themselves which sport they like best. <laughs> Just thought of a little, a little sarcasm here. Um, uh, I, I have sensed a... Uh, uh, a battle, okay, a battle even in preparing for this sermon and more the next next week, or if I can delay it, maybe uh, then then in several weeks I'll, I'll I'll get to think about this one. But you could read ahead, but don't do it now in your text. Just park on eleven and twelve of First Peter. But I sense a spiritual battle even in preparing for this message, and crumpled up a whole entire other message on this very same text and rewrote what you see before you. And under a note of encouragement is how can how can we by this text be helped in preparation for the spiritual battle that we are all in, the spiritual battle that we are facing. And so I got this word, never forget. It's a kind of a 9-11 weekend here. Never forget, never forget. Never forget that we are on, first of all, foreign soil. We are on foreign soil. We are in uh, occupied territory. Uh, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. I think it's helpful for us to remember that we are in a time of temporary residency on this planet. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. And I wanted to sing that song, Maybe We Shall at the end. We are we are sojourning here uh, in New Jersey and near Egg Harbor. There's a, a church that I think, you know, today we have beautiful, innovative, creative names and you never know what's going on inside a church just by the name. But it was the name Sojourn. Sojourn. And I thought, well there's a there's kind of an interesting name. Maybe similar to the slogan I want to put up on the road, um, uh, found to follow, to gather uh, together. And to gather together, you know, is the thought here to, to sojourn that we got a little time on this planet and, and thank God for the breath of fresh air that we can be to one another in this crazy world that we are aliens. We're the aliens. Uh, we're the illegals. OK, uh, we're the ones that don't belong here. And, and, and there's a war going on. And, and so this this word um, uh, to remember that we are we are on foreign uh, soil. We are on foreign soil. We are citizens of heaven uh, first and foremost and primarily. Amen. Uh, that's our citizenship is in heaven. And we, we are in exile here until that uh, time that is spoken of uh, in the text, a time of visitation. Our real home is in heaven. Our real citizenship is in heaven. And I think it's important to remember uh, that as we go through this, therefore, our loyalty uh, is in God's truth, and it's in God's it's in God's future. And so, like strangers, we we live in a world uh, that prefers to ignore God. That's the story. That's the sadness of this day. That's the sadness of this place that we're in. And so, we are aliens and strangers. The psalmist said, "I am a stranger in the earth." He said, uh, uh, thy statutes have been my song. This is in Psalm 119, verses 19 and 54. My, thy statutes have been my song in the house of my pilgrimage. And like the prophets of old, they died in faith. They didn't yet receive the promise, but they saw them afar off. They were persuaded of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. And so this lifelong uh, pilgrimage, it's not an eternal lifelong, it's just a temporary lifelong, it's just a blip on the radar screen of a little time that we are on this planet 
and we're sojourning here. And so we should be glad that this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Don't drive the tent stakes too deeply, too deeply. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll face the township and they want to ask us about some things that are permanent or not permanent around here. I'm sure somewhere there's a tent ordinance. It's probably been shelved with uh, COVID. Oh, how excited I was to, to hear that this tabernacle here could be taken down, but not taken down. That we only had to take down the tent part and could leave the tent stakes up. So we could drive them down and I didn't have to drive them and redrive them and drive them and redrive them and put the whole thing up again, uh, but just one time. Uh, but I wonder how deep our tent stakes are in this world, which is not our home, which we're just passing through, which we're just foreigners in, which we're just strangers in. And, and that our tent stakes should not be deeply sunk. Why? Because we are to remember as we prepare for battle that we are foreigners, we are strangers, we are sojourners, we are aliens, we are just a passing through this old earth. Amen. I'm kind of I'm kind of glad because this world is not a friend to grace to lead us on to God. Uh, but we have this attitude. That we're just just uh, strangers here, so the tent stakes aren't driven too deeply. Which leads us to the next uh, reminder that we should never forget. Not only are we on foreign soil, but we are in a spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, else we would arm, else we would try to uh, uh, rid ourselves of all the enemy in some physical or some material, m m uh, not material, but well, material and uh, uh, military way. Uh, no, the weapons are not, are, are not uh, 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 carnal, they're not worldly, they're not fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, every one of us are in a spiritual battle. And if, if you don't feel that spiritual battle, uh, then, then I'd, I'd encourage you to put some spiritual antennas on. It's a spiritual battle today to be a godly parent. Amen. It's a spiritual battle today to be a godly spouse and have a godly home. It's a spiritual battle to be a godly neighbor, you say, well, you don't have neighbors like I do. <laughs> maybe, maybe your neighbors are angels, okay? And that's a, that's a good thing. It's a spiritual battle today to live in this culture, in this society. It's a spiritual battle uh, to deal with the intrusion of unholywood. Oh, did I say Hollywood? Uh, unholywood uh, uh, coming in. It's a spiritual battle uh, today uh, to have... Uh, in our culture, invading all of our airways, the www web, the World by Wicked Wasting Time 10% Wonderful Web. What did you say? Yes, it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle to open our mouth for Jesus in this day. It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual battle. And the great spiritual battle mentioned here is that we would abstain from fleshly lusts which war against our soul. There's a battle. To live holy in our personal life. The Bible says in Galatians 5, and we'll read a key uh, in verse 16, but skip to 17 at this moment. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And, and there's a, a battle going on. Um, the works of the flesh in chapter 5 and verse 19 are manifest and some are listed adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies envies murders drunkenness revelings and then i like the next phrase in verse 21 the etc it says in the king james the such like and there's a battle going on I'm glad there's something else going on, like the fruit of the Spirit, which are mentioned also in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, in 1 Peter, our author says in chapter 4, verse 2, that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but 
to do the will of God. There's a there's an answer here that 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 is present, but I'm dealing with the prop problem first is that there is a spiritual warfare going on for our very soul. The verse that I've listed maybe in your outline on Romans 13, it says to walk honestly as in the day. And it mentions some of these fleshly things in rioting, drunkenness, chambering, wantonness, strife, and envy. The temptation, the pull, the weight of this old world. And then the answer, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and then a real answer, uh, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Make no provision for it. Wow. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. So we live in a, in a dirty world, in a dirty world. In our text, there's a, there's a secret answer but I wasn't satisfied with putting it down as just one word prior to the change of my outline, even right this morning before I printed it. And so I changed it from the secret weapon of to the secret weapon of the, and you could write down the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We got a secret weapon. Amen. I, I like secret weapons. They sound exciting to me. Uh, you got the all-powerful, almighty God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling in our hearts. And the Bible says, walk in the Spirit, verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's the, there's the answer, the secret weapon. There's a secret weapon in our text of, of, of 1 Peter chapter 2. It says that you would, and it uses this word, abstain, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. If I could give you and I any help, uh, it would be to echo what Peter is giving to these dear, beloved, beseeched, begged, pleaded with ones that are pilgrims and strangers, that they would abstain from the fleshly lusts that are in this world. A absence. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting key. It's a, an exciting abs uh, answer to this war against the world, the flesh, and the devil that comes at us from all kinds of different directions. It's radical amputation. Uh, the Bible says in Job chapter 1 that Job was a just man. He was a just man. He feared God and he eschewed evil. That's an interesting word. It means he cut himself off from evil. In the text is to to hold yourself completely away from the lusts that are present here. I'd like you to consider the blessing of radical amputation in the word abstinence. You see, we are on foreign soil. And if you're in foreign soil, and, and, and I, I, I was thankful yesterday to a man who, who had a Vietnam veteran cap on. And I just, I just thanked him. I thanked him. I have a friend who was in a platoon in Vietnam, and I believe he was the only one or him and one other uh, came out alive, alive. If you're in foreign soil, you have to be a little careful, okay? I wrote down a bunch of things about these weaponry and, and imagery of battle on a foreign soil. Uh, don't let your communications break down, and I want to spiritualize it, and that is, that is uh, prayer. Uh, don't don't lose sight of your mission. Don't lose uh, communication with your your commander in chief, God. Uh, don't don't weaponize your enemy. Wow, there's a there's an interesting one. Okay, don't weaponize your enemy. Don't give him the tools. Don't give him the foothold in your life. Don't give him the power of of feeding the flesh and then wanting victory over the flesh. Don't give him the weapons of making provision for the flesh and then wondering why you succumb to the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Job was this just man. He, he, he feared God and he eschewed evil. I'll never forget the youth meeting where they asked for volunteers of teenagers to come up. And, and they didn't have any idea what they were volunteering for, but the hands went up. And then the... the uh, 
youth pastor there got out, uh, you know, kind of a bench, maybe a piano bench. And, and this would be abusive today. Okay, I want you to understand. But this is what he did. It made a very Im- great impact on my soul as, as, a, as a youth leader myself. I wasn't a young person, thankfully, then, because my hand would have been up. He got a couple of buckets out, and he put the buckets out. And then I don't know if he had a big sword with him or he just had an imaginary sword that he was talking about because he asked for volunteers to come up and lay their neck down on the the bench and the buckets were to catch their head that would roll off. You say, what? You say, I, I didn't do this, okay? I've done a lot of crazy things as a pastor. I have not done this. He was preaching on Job chapter 1 of Job being a just man who feared God and eschewed evil. It means that he cut it off, okay, and separated himself. As if you were cutting off an arm or a limb or a pendant. <laughs> he had these kids going. Let me tell you, he had these kids going. And he put a graphic idea in, 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 a, in, a, in a teenager's mind, or in my mind also, that the only way to deal with sin is radical amputation. And somebody said, amen. Uh, to not feed the flesh. Uh, they say, feed a... Feed a fever, starve a cold, starve a cold, feed a fever. I always forget which one to do. That's why it probably lingers on. I don't even know. If but how about starve a temptation by radical ampl- amputation? How about getting our armor on and realizing that we are in a war? How about realizing there needs to be a proper defense of that of, of many of those armor pieces, and then there is an offense like the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. If you're not witnessing vibrantly for Jesus, I would say you're on the defeat side, not the victor side, in this weapon of the world and the flesh and the devil. If you're living like the devil, you're not going to scare the devil. You're not going to have an influence on those who are influenced by the devil. It's as simple as that. You're not going to even have a concern for lost souls and living in such a way. Uh, you won't have the defensive armor on, the helmet uh, and the shield and the, the girding about of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and living rightly. Uh, and then the offensive of the sword of the spirit like Jesus had when he was tempted uh, there in the early of his ministry. And he answered the temptation, each of them, with the word of God. That's what's powerful. And we don't hardly spend any time in the word of God, memorizing, meditating, and applying and mentioning the word of God to the various temptations uh, behind us. We could just echo Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. That's a good one right there. Or man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, but by every, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And in and, and each time Jesus uh, answered temptation with scripture, let the word of God dwell in you richly and you will find victory over the temptations of the world, the flesh of the devil in our lives. I, 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 I think uh, a defense is, is very good and our defense is God and our defense is scripture. But I also like an offense of living for God, a vibrant Christian life. And I'm think, thinking of Jonathan Hammer's um, advice uh, to the Philadelphia Eagles, and I just have to throw it in here, okay? Because he wants to be the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles after he is the president of the United States, and then he wants to be the pastor, not with me, but without me. <laughs> I, 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 I love Jonathan. But, but he gives, if you ask him, uh, what's your advice as coach to the Philadelphia Eagles? And he says something so profound, you just scratch your head and say, Jonathan, that is amazing. And what he says as an advice to the coach and to, as the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles would be a certain Super Bowl shoe in. It would be a definite second ring uh, for for the. Is it just the second or is it the third? Dave will correct me. Did they did they ever run? Did they ever win before the Vikings gave them the win? Um, did they did they did they ever did they ever do that? Uh, it would be a a game plan, a game plan 
uh, that would certainly win the entire season and the Super Bowl. And so what's Jonathan's advice as the coach of the Eagles? And I'd like to spiritualize it a little bit. He just says, he just says, don't get hurt and keep the defense off the field. Simple. Simple. Think about it. Don't get hurt and keep the defense off the field. If you keep the defense off the field, you will win the Super Bowl. <laughs> okay? Uh, that will mean your offense is out there, like, all the time, and and they are three and out every time. And you will win the Super Bowl with that strategy. But I wonder if we could take it spiritually, that if we have a good offense of, of, of the offensive weapons of praying, the offensive weapons of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the offensive weapons of the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and our desires to witness and be a blessing to people, it will call us, cause us, it will compel us to live a life victorious over the world, the flesh, and the devil. I tell you right now, if lust got you beat up, and you know what? That's different in all of our situations. I've read some lists, but remember the such like of the etc. For the devil is a sly old fox, and if he can't get us from the front side, he'll get us from the behind side. If he can't get us from the behind side, he'll get us from the upside, the downside, the inside, the outside. And, 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 and the little kid's song is probably pertinent. The devil is a sly old fox. If I could catch him, in a, I'd put him in a box for all the tricks he's played on me. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and we are in a spiritual battle. If, if you don't sense it, if you don't feel it on a daily, weekly basis, if you don't sense it in this old wicked world, then, then, then maybe you're not in tune with, with what even Peter's saying. But there is a spiritual battle of worldly lust that war against your soul. And they want to neutralize you so that you will be no good for God and for good and for lost souls. And so the best defense is a good offense. And, and, and so there's a, a need for us to, to obey the commands and keep the communication and, 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 not, uh, uh, and, and to, to be on our guard and, and to not weaponize the enemy with, uh, with a caving in and a provision for the flesh. And, and so all these are good advice uh, like is given in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where it says to avoid all the appearance of evil. And, and I used to have that verse used against uh, me growing one hair over my ear because I was supposed to avoid the appearance of evil. And, and I, I don't think that that was it. <laughs> I used to hear that verse when, you know, it was about dress and about some outward, some external thing. And, and I, I think the uh, proper understanding is to avoid all appearance of evil. The, the idea is that when, when evil appears, when evil presents itself, avoid it. Run. Run like Joseph did. Run, run, get the other way, turn it off, shut it off, uh, uh, stop it, uh, get some new friends, get some new info, listen to some different music, uh, watch some different, shut it, use the off button, uh, it, don't feed and fuel the flesh, and then get busy serving God and living for God is the, is the need. Go about, as we'll end soon the message, with doing good and helping one another. Uh, that's, that's the need. And so there's a advice here today in this, that there's a, a secret weapon. And it's the Holy Spirit of God calling us to abstinence from the worldly lusts that pull us downward. So have a radical amputation abstain from fleshly lust don't indulge them to the expense of our soul uh, live for the Lord and feed and fuel the Spirit of God Proverbs 4 24 verse 9 it says the thought of foolishness is sin the thought of foolishness is sin there is a wonderful ministry of the Spirit of God in our hearts and in our minds where something evil would come in our mind, like, let's go rob a bank on the way home from church. <laughs> and you say, well, I can't believe I heard that in church. How would that thought even come in my mind? And you, and you amputate that thought right there and say, Pastor Becker, quit talking that way, <laughs> okay? I was just thinking about doing the same. Then stop, stop. 
Stop thinking. Stop entertaining. In a long time before you would consummate and do something that's wrong, if we would realize the thought of foolishness is sin, and God, please, God, please forgive me right there. You say, is, is it wrong to be tempted? And someone described temptation as a bird flying over our head. We live in this world, and we will be tempted by this world. And, and, and the, 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 the answer is don't let the bird make a nest in your hair, okay? You can't stop living in this world, but you can stop feeding and fueling and making that temptation so big that that's all you think about. Confess it in your heart and confess it in your mind and fill your mind with the Word of God and use the Scripture in a, in a positive way for the glory of God. Why? Because we want to make an impact on this world for God that we're strangers and sojourners in. So we should realize there's a military campaign going on. That's that's what the word is, which war against your soul. We got to realize that there's there's terroristic threats. We got to realize that there's rebels and guerrilla warfares and and they come in to destroy our joy. They come in to destroy our homes. They come in to destroy our peace, our usefulness, our happiness. They come in to destroy our effectiveness for God. They come in to destroy even the power of the preaching of the word of God right now with distractions and and other things that would be more attraction. The pleasures of sin for a season. And God says we're to abstain from these sinful desires that war against us and not yield ourselves to these destructive and sinful desires. So helping you today, I'm reminding you, as Peter reminds us, that we are on foreign soil, number one, and we are in spiritual warfare, every one of us, And thirdly, this is not the exciting part. I'll try to end there. But we are under false accusations. False accusations. Having your conversation honest among among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers. False accusations. That's the world that we live. But yet there's a need of honest living. Conversation, our manner of living, to be filled with honest integrity for the glory of God that we would do right no matter what anybody says. That there is an enemy that would speak even against us doing right. And it's insidious, and it's sadistic, and it's discouraging. When someone says that life within is something that can be murdered. And you would say one thing and they would call it another. And they would call you the bad guy for not exalting a woman's health. Today, if you don't agree with the sexual revolution and you say to your granddaughter, she's a daughter, a girl, and was made that way for the glory of God by an all-wise creator and encouraging them and building that femininity that's biblical and godly or that masculinity for a grandson you are called the enemy abusive trying to hinder the freedom this is the world we live in if you say a marriage is between a man and a woman period if you say the bible is the word of god If you say there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, you're called abusive. It must be in preparation for my sermon today that yesterday on 9-11, I got texts saying 
Stop teaching children about eternal hell. I consider that child abuse. That's what I got. I didn't have to make this stuff up. I said, Lord, give me a good illustra- illustration today. How about this one? Just to jar your thinking. It's 9-11 and my tolerance for religious people is done for the day. Wow. wow. Because 9-11 was all about religion. Whoa. Whoa. I further it. Just to say that there are people who say things that'll get you downright discouraged. And they will falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And it's not new. It's not something that just started to happen. Peter dealt with it. Today... As in yesterday, I read, is a day to remember how religion has destroyed our society, including Christianity, poisonous belief systems into the minds of children from generation to generation. And you, Pastor Gary Becker, are orchestrating that. Whoa. Thank God my child wasn't involved with that. They can now think for themselves. You and everyone like you are the enemies of reason. It will be difficult for me to continue any fruitful dialogue as if we were having one. And then he gives words that I cannot read and he did not write uh, the way uh, they really are. And I say, F, you and your God and to your stupid holy book and all of its immoral teachings. It is the most false, self-righteous thing I've ever seen. I'm done sugarcoating. You will always be part of the problem and not any of the solution. Um, I say, Lord, Lord, I'm trying to prepare my heart for this sermon. And I get this text. You say, you made that up. No, no, I, I, I read it. And it was texted to me. Okay. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And if you're going uh, down with the stream of this world, then you'll probably never face any resistance or any type of criticism like this. But if that old dead fish now has been given new life in Christ and you realize that you're on foreign soil or in a foreign stream and that you're going the wrong direction and you turn around and start going against the current of this world, you can expect. You can expect resistance. You can expect it. They can accuse us of a lot of things, but Peter reminds his people, don't let them accuse you of dishonesty. Live honestly in this world. A life of integrity, even when integrity hurts you. Even when it costs you. Let them count on us, even though they will malign and say bad things against us, that we have an exemplary life among the natives, okay, of this foreign land that we occupy. In Peter's day, they would accuse the Christians of rebellion because they were not following step with the government of Rome. They would accuse them of terrorism and blame them on the burning of Rome. They would accuse the Christians of atheism because they would not bow down to their religious God. They would accuse them of cannibalism because they had this little service where where they had a cracker and some grape juice and and they said it was the body and blood of the Lord. They would accuse them of immorality for their unfeigned love of the brethren, of loving one another. Uh, They would accuse them of damaging the social progress of of an insurrection to slavery, though uh, wonderfully threaded uh, in the New Testament, is not an insurrection, but a real freedom and a real equality, a bond and and free and Greek and and, and, and Gentile and Jew. And oh, what, what wonderful answers are in this scripture. But they would be accused of all of the above and more, and we shall too expect it. If you expect it, then it's okay. You're going to get shot at uh, from a sniper in the mountains. 
And when you got that covered, you're going to get stabbed by a brother in your back. Okay? Expect it. Expect it. And prepare yourself for a spiritual battle. Why? We are on foreign soil. And we are in a spiritual warfare. And we are under a false accusation. But I don't want to leave you here today. For the Bible says we are on, fourthly, the winning side. We are on the winning side. And if you want to say amen somewhere, say amen now. We are on the winning side. There, there is. It says that they, even those ones who would falsely accuse you, would by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Uh, that that evil will be overcome with good. In fact, God says that. He says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And do good to them and pray for them uh, and, and, and bless them that persecute you. And this is the answer. And, and good will overcome evil. God says so. You can count on it. So replace uh, the negative of the worldly lust with the positives of God doing goodness like Jesus, who is our example, who went about doing good. One of my favorite verses about Jesus is in Acts chapter 10, and it describes his entire earthly ministry. It says how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, filled with power, and then this little phrase, who went about doing good, who went about doing good. If you want to know what to do today, do some good. Just ask God. I was driving down the road today, and I was buried in my sermon notes, going over them once. And my my wife said, my wife said, I wonder what he's doing. And I looked up, and she's going sixty miles an hour, sixty five miles an hour past a guy walking on the freeway. <laughs> we, we we couldn't turn around, but I I asked her if she was going to stop and help him. Uh, and and she probably thought he was going to hijack her car or something. I <laughs> said. And then, then we turn another corner, and she says, did you see that? I said, see what? She says, she thinks that car is burning up. I said, are you going to turn around? All we have to do is ask God and open our eyes and say, what good can I do in this old world? And, and open our eyes and help someone and bless someone. And you, you say, oh, it's going to cost me. It might cost you some time. It might cost you some treasure. It might cost you just a smile. Just to give away a hug and a smile and bless somebody and encourage somebody in their day wouldn't cost you anything. Just to go out of your way and be a blessing and, and go about doing good and helping, helping someone and being a testimony. The Bible says that they, by your good works, that your actions will refute their prejudices against you. And they want to pick hole in your armor and see where you're failing and falling. Don't, don't. Give them uh, that chance of, of living a hypocrisy life that's succumbing to the lusts of the flesh, but live a life victorious from the inside and then in the outside doing good and blessing other people. There's the answer for the battle is that I want to please God today. I want, I want this message to be, as I stand here uh, each Sunday, to be the most important message everyone needs to hear. And the devil's uh, trying to discourage me from preaching it at all. And, and, and yet it's just what I needed and just what you need today. Uh, and what I needed yesterday to answer those texts or, or even not answer them. <laughs> okay. It's just, I'm done. I'm done talking to religious people today. Okay. That's fine. I'm not going not gonna to pour salt in that wound. Okay. Uh, just to God, give us wisdom to step in this world for the glory of God and be a blessing to people. They say in communist Russia, atheistic communist Russia, that they wouldn't have made it without the work ethic of the Christians who had a higher boss. <laughs> and with no motivation and no increased income, worked hard because they had a higher boss. They were, they were working for God. They were, they were living for God. It's not supposed to be easy in our life, but we can have an effective testimony. And like Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You say, what's happened there? Well, the 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 anti anti Christian, the against people have a have a visitation coming. Now, hopefully, it's an early visitation of meeting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because they looked at your life and said, "Whatever you got, I want. 
I wonder, is anybody anybody looking at your life and saying, hey, I want that peace. Hey, I want I want that joy. Hey, I want that purpose. I want that power in my life. What you got that I don't got? I need some. And you say it's God. And you and you and you and you there's a day of visitation. It may be the reference to the final and the future visitation. And, and I want to tell you um, in closing and delicately that God will be glorified, e- even in judgment, even in judgment. Now, it could be by the conversion or it could be by the condemnation of wicked people. All that we pray for the conversion, that they would see our good works and come to a, a visitation of God and behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, that they would come to Jesus as their personal Savior through a careful watching of his representatives, you and I, living for the glory of God. But this day of visitation is not a tea party, okay? It's not Jesus coming for a cup of tea. <laughs> this is this is this is talking about a day of visitation. The Old Testament prophets talked about a visiting of God, and the context were that of judgment. Uh, we ought to prepare for judgment. Ecclesiastes says that because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of men is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God and which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall there be a prolong of his days, which are as a shadow, uh, because he feareth not before God. The end of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verse 14, the very last verse, it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment, and every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. There's a, there's a day of visitation coming. The Bible says every word, every idle word, uh, will be given account of in the day of judgment. That's in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, it says there is a day when God shall judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ. God, God, God's going to judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ. And so there's a, there's a day of reckoning. There's a day of, of judgment. Um, there's a, there's, there's a, a visitation of Almighty God that we need to prepare for, and the Holy Spirit of God wants us to prepare today. Prepare today. Don't write off people that misunderstand, twist, malign, and stab you in the back uh, and say that your uh, good is evil. Maybe God is working on their hearts. And one day, as you show them Christ in your life, even those very ones who criticize and who have no time for God will be praising God with you. Amen. Praising God with you. Why? Because there's a, a day of visitation when God judges the world. I thought, Lord, give me a give me a good illustration to end the sermon. And and I couldn't think of any. And then to my mind came the thief, the, the, the thief on the cross. You say, which one? The good one. No, no, no. There were, there were neither. <laughs> neither were good. But there was one good one on the cross. And one saw that goodness of Jesus Christ and said, this man has done nothing wrong. Amen. And turned to Jesus Christ in faith and heard of a visitation when Jesus Christ himself said to him this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. All your sins forgiven. And a wonderful preparation made for that day of visitation. How about you? Are you prepared for a day of visitation? We got around here today and prayed, Lord, you be our unseen guest. Lord, you sit in one of these empty seats so that we would worship you, that we would sing to you, that we that I would preach as if you were present, Lord Jesus Christ, because he is. Amen? Amen. And, and that God would wake us up to realize that we're in this world as sojourners and that we are involved in a spiritual warfare. Uh, look out and, and look around and, and put your armor on 
and, and that, that there are people who every good thing you do will call it evil in this twisted, jaded world. But one day, everything's going to be made right, and you, on the Lord's side, are on the winning side. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this confidence. Thank you for this scripture that is just what we need today, just what I needed yesterday and this morning. And Father, this day, Father, and we thank you. And we pray that if there's anyone here today that does not know you as personal Savior, that they would run this day uh, to glorify you and that there'd be a holy visitation of accepting Christ. And now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Oh, Lord, we pray for that visitation. Lord, let there be a visitation of the Holy Spirit of God, the only a key to abstinence from this worldly, fleshly lust, which would drag us down in the same muck and mire. And we do not run with them anymore to that excess, Lord, of lustful living, Father. Help us to have the radical amputation that would not feed and fuel the flesh and make provision of it, Lord, but that we would realize even if people say the worst about us, Lord, that we would live a life of honesty and integrity and filled with good works to bless this world, preparing for, looking for, uh, anticipating eagerly, Lord, that day of visitation where we'll stand before you. And so we thank you for the Apostle Peter, in writing us this reminder that it's a battlefield, not a recreation room. It's a fight. It's not a game. Prepare us, dear Lord, for a spiritual battle. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.